Hey folks, Craig Levati here with the Houston Museum of Natural Science. Today, I am touring the newly remixed, newly revamped George W. Strake Hall of Malacology, and I have associate curator Tina Petway to go along with me. Now, Tina, you have been working on the new George W. Strake Hall of Malacology for it seems like months now. A year. A year. A year. <laughs> months. Let's, let's narrow it down and make it a year. We've really kind of been focusing on doing this reproduction of a new hall for about 15 years. Looking at revamping, revitalizing, reusing what was here before and adding to with new specimens. I feel that we are trying to convey the importance of maintaining the health of the oceans of which mollusks are part of that food chain. They're part of that basis of life. If they go, lots of other things are gonna go and when that happens, people will go as well. So they're not just pretty shells. There is an important reason for them to be here. We want people to understand why they're important. They're not just pretty. Although they are beautiful, they struggle on the, the coral reef just like um, they would struggle on the savanna in Africa. There's the same struggles for life. There's life and death. There's grazers. If it wasn't for the grazers, everything would be overgrown. If it wasn't for the predators, there would be too much of everything. So everything has a place, and that's what we've tried to show here. Tina, are you ready to show me some I'm of your favorite spots I'm dying to show you some here? of my favorite. And speaking of <laughs> where, some of my favorite start? spots, we're going to show you this first. <laughs> this is the world's largest gastropod shell. Next to it is the world's largest albino gastropod shell. They both happen to be the same species. They come from Australia, and their common name is the Australian trumpet. How did we get this here at the museum in Houston? This one was purchased by us about uh, 10 years ago from a gentleman who found it in, um, I believe it was Taiwan. He was there on a collecting trip. He was a shell dealer and he was there on a collecting trip. And he was driving through some small fishing villages and this shell was in the front yard of someone. Obviously, so, it probably wasn't this clean. No, well, it yeah. was not clean. It was not <laughs> by any means. It was not clean. Biggest trumpet shell, correct? This that, is that the biggest. This is the this biggest, is one. The biggest Guys, in the world. This is the biggest this one in the world. This is the biggest and it's in the world. Right it's here right Houston. here. <laughs> It makes me happy. This one we acquired from the same gentleman. He also acquired this one. I'm not sure of the story behind how he acquired it, but at the time he bought it, he wasn't sure that it was an albino. He thought it might be because it still had the periostracum on it. Periostracum is kind of like an outer skin that helps protect the, the shell inside from things like barnacles, uh, worm tubes, incrustations of calcium from getting on and growing. But what he could see didn't look like the normal coloration. So when he got it back to, to uh, California, to his home, he did allow some of it to come off and he was positive then that it was a true albino. There is no color at all. I don't think of any of this stuff as like food. It's all food. To me, it just, it's, to me it's just it's museum pieces. I don't think of it as food. Everything here is edible. It, and 80% of what is here has been consumed by people before it came here. So they weren't specifically collected for us or for anyone. They were food. This used to be lunch, dinner. It was. It yeah. was. And most of it's really good, I can tell you, because I've eaten pretty much everything <laughs> in here, land snails included. Now, obviously, the museum has been around for 110 years now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people wouldn't know this, but our shell collection, we have over a million pieces. We have we over do. a million specimens we here. Do. Is that due to us being so close to the Gulf? That is part of it. Okay. That is basically how this collection started, was um, Gulf of Mexico material, particularly Texas. So that's the Houston area has basically emboldened this whole collection It here. really has, it really has. It has really bloomed the whole collection to the point where we were internationally known. And once that happens, then you are, have the opportunity to acquire specimens like our giant specimens yeah. here. Otherwise, people feel like it's just gonna sit on a shelf in a museum and never be appreciated. It's gonna be at the beach house that somewhere and nobody's gonna yeah, look at that it. That doesn't yeah. happen here. We're using whatever we can in the best ways we know how.
All of the works here at the exhibition are made out of Lego bricks. That's where I found my passion, creating art out of this little toy from my childhood. Several different types of work. Some are replicas of things from art history. Some are just whimsical things I've thought of. Some have a little more avant-garde thinking to them. And some are just, just very big sculptures like this Tyrannosaurus Rex behind me. One of the themes I'm noticing as we're walking through the new Malacology Hall is our connection to these things. It's impossible to fathom how connected we are to these guys. It really is. It's not just shells that we've put on exhibit. The, the thing is, these have been part of the lives of humanity since man started walking uh, and, and collecting things for food. They would walk along uh, the edge of the ocean and yeah. see easily accessible things that they could eat as well as uh, fresh water walking through creeks or a river, they would come across clams, things that were edible, that were easy to get to. It probably wasn't fun to be the first guy to step on one of these No, either. I would not prefer to do that <laughs> at all, no. That's like the ultimate stepping oh. on a Lego at oh, your house. Or worse, this thing, like, or worse. Can that you would imagine straight stepping? up go through my Ooh. foot. Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would definitely <laughs> but would. That's you also... would not break that, it would break you. Now, alongside us showing beautiful shells through here, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful pieces, we're also showing people how they can sort of save these guys in their everyday lives. Yep, there's a big impact that humans can make. That, that it's small things. You don't have to do things like give up using your car. Um, you don't have to give up eating meat. But there are small things, and we've kind of highlighted those throughout the exhibit by looking for the pearls of wisdom symbol and it tells you different things that you can do at home that are simple and easy. Like instead of throwing away your plastics, reuse them. We want to preserve and protect what we have. Not just here on the Texas coast, but worldwide. If we don't make an impact now on what we're doing to save these systems, our whole world could collapse because of the lack of food, because of not having fresh water. Now towards the end of the exhibit, we have a presentation about climate change mm -hmm. and how you know mankind is sort of facilitating you know, the, the destruction of some of this stuff. It, it, we're not helping things along the best way we can. 500 years in the future shows this museum would be underwater. So we've got to make a difference and hopefully people will see this and understand it's not something that could happen 10,000 years from now. It is going to happen we can make an impact to make the least possible impact on when it does happen. Try to slow it down a little bit. Absolutely. We can keep it to a minimum. It's very easy to do. I think I can almost hear I-10 in this shell. All right, folks, come see the new George W. Strake Hall of Malacology. Tina Petway really did a great job on this hall, and I think you guys are all going to love it. For more information on this exhibit and many more, go to hms.org forward slash exhibits.